Today on the Purpose Based Retirement, the four horsemen of the retirement apocalypse, while your financial advisor may not be discussing taxes with you, and the hidden risks hiding inside of your IRA. Welcome to the Purpose Based Retirement with certified financial planner practitioner Casey Weed. It's not how much we make during the good times, it's how much we keep during those really bad times. Casey leads a team of financial advisors with decades of experience, helping families across the country retire with the confidence they deserve. The Purpose-Based Retirement assigns every dollar you've saved a specific purpose to meet a key retirement need. Whatever risk you faced, we've got a plan for that. Stay tuned and learn how you can look forward to a worry-free, purpose-based retirement. Good to see you again. Thanks for joining us. I'm Lee Kelso here with Casey Weed, Certified Financial Planner and the President of Howard Bailey Financial. You know, if you are one of those people who has worked all their lives and saved as hard as you can, now you're a couple years away from retirement, five, ten years away from retirement, if you don't change your thinking, you could be overrun by what we're calling the four horsemen of the retirement apocalypse. You're going to have to help me understand that. Well, I know it sounds really scary. The retirement apocalypse, the four horsemen of the retirement apocalypse. And I, I think, you know, I just want to put it in perspective because we make this transition out of, you know, the accumulation stage where it's just growth at all costs. We're trying to make as much return as possibly can. And we're throwing money into different mutual funds inside of our 401k and not really thinking about all the dollars and the cents. Now, beyond that, now we've got things to really be concerned about that aren't just correlated to our investments and that's what we're calling the four horsemen of our retirement apocalypse it's covering more than just your investments and your asset allocation there's also long-term care retirement income traditional health care how do we cover all of these different major risks and make sure we actually ultimately stay in retirement i think that retirement should be viewed as a major ailment Right, you know, it's it's not a cut, it's not a bruise. We don't just slap a Band-Aid on it or some some hot ice, right? We have to actually sit down with a professional, just like we would with a physician, and have them put together a comprehensive plan for not today, but to manage this disease for the rest of our lives. It's 30 years, 20 years of unemployment. We may not have the ability to go out and put in overtime or make a little bit extra just so we can cover that emergency or that health care problem that arises. Yeah, so these four these four ailments are going to happen to everybody in retirement in one way or another, most likely. We want to start with asset allocation. Now, what do you mean by that? How we are assigning our and, and investing our are, are what we've accumulated over the years? Well, I think it's very difficult to make this transition into retirement for most because they have this FOMO, as, as I guess the kids call it today, which is the fear of missing out, right? We have the fear that we're gonna miss out and our coworkers going to make 20% next year and we only got 10. Or we made five and our neighbor next to us made 10. We don't wanna miss out on the potential big gains that we could experience. I'm guilty of that as well. You know, I've seen gains that have been in my 401k and I'm going, oh wow, you know, that's exciting. I get excited about those big gains and that cash continuing to grow. However, sooner or later, we've got to determine, hey, we have enough. And sometimes this starts with a plan. Once we actually put together a plan, now we can say, okay, my hurdle rate or my required rate of return is X. I don't need to be as aggressive as I am or I have been in the past. And a lot of folks say, well, I'm not at retirement yet. I've still got five more years. Well, if we have five more years, but we have another 2008 happen, maybe you can recover for the, from those losses over the next five years, but you won't have any gains. Or maybe it's worse than that. Maybe we experience a lost decade like we did at the start of this century, and now you have 10 years you go without any interest in your account. And sometimes it's not that you can't retire with a negative balance. You can't even retire with an account balance that's broken even again. Mm -hmm. It's time to get more conservative. And doing that in the interest rate environment we have today means we might have to turn away from our broker that just sells us stocks and bonds and start looking at alternative fixed income classes, much like some of the largest trust funds in the world do. 
And so we have to adopt a more conservative mindset and get ready for, I get that, so you have to, you have to set aside that FOMO thing. That makes a lot of sense to me. I understand that. What about health care? That's another big one that we all need to pay attention to. Yeah, well, health care, a lot of people think about health care as long-term care, but it's really, we're talking about traditional health care insurance here. And, and I'm not going to say this is an easy thing to plan for because it's not. It's just, it's just downright expensive today. Family coverages and family premiums are up almost 250% since the year 2000. And that's made it very difficult for the average retiree to step in to retirement at all. They're post, many retirees are postponing retirement. I've got people I've worked with that can actually, they can actually retire and afford to pay for their own health insurance. Even if it was $1,000 a month, they could afford it, but they just can't pull the trigger and spend that kind of money because they've never had to spend that kind of money before. And now they're postponing retirement. And then for those of you that are going to retire at 65 or continue to work for that matter through to the age of 70, you have have to make sure you hit the right points when you go to sign up for Medicare Part A, Part B. Now, Part A is paid out of payroll taxes. Part B, you pay a premium for. And a lot of folks don't realize that. They say, well, I just need to get to 65 and everything will be covered. Reality is the average Medicare Part B premium, just a standard premium, is $134 a month. Well, once you start adding in potentially large income as well, you might see that those premiums start to go up. And that's what they call IRMA, Income Related Monthly Adjustment Amounts. So you might end up paying more premiums in Medicare because you have too much taxable income. This is where I think your financial planner and CPA come into play to keep that taxable income down, give you a tax-free retirement so you don't have to worry about higher health care costs as part of higher, higher federal and state local taxes. So the graphic we had on your screen there also indicated that there can be a 10% penalty, and I know that's going to concern many of you. I know that caught your attention, so explain that to me. What yeah. is this 10% penalty about? You know, if, if we do, if let's say we're continuing to work, or, or one of the most often things that I see, it, it's really about forgetting to sign up for your Medicare Part B premiums. And what a lot of people do is they'll sign up for COBRA, and they have 18 months on COBRA, but they've got eight months from the first day that they end employment, first day of the month from the month they end their employment to sign up for Part B. And if they delay that, if that intersects inappropriately with their COBRA coverage, then they could end up with a 10% permanent penalty, permanent premium penalty on their Part B premiums. And so these are things that I think affect your retirement. So why wouldn't your financial advisor be trying to help you with these things? Yeah, I get that completely. Retirement income is one that's kind of a no-brainer, but if I'm just working with my average, the same guy I've been, been investing with all my life, am I getting the best advice? Well, a lot of advisors don't specialize in retirement income planning. There's really only one area that we can go out there today that can provide financial advisors with retirement income education, and that is the Retirement Income Certified Professional designation. And that is something that, that we've been through at, at our team in order to make sure we understand things like pension decisions and, I think most importantly, Social Security decisions. You know, and just putting together an income strategy for retirement in the first place. But those social security decisions are massive. And there was a study done recently by the Nationwide uh, Retirement Institute that said only 12% of advisors actually advise their clients on how they should be uh, putting together that social security strategy. Most people are, end up on their own and many individuals don't really understand how those benefits change year over year. The difference between filing at age 62 and age 70, there's a very small percentage of people that really understand that, let alone filing strategies. We had somebody that called into our office this past week and they wanted a social security analysis done for them. We did their social security analysis and he called in and said, I'm planning on filing this way. Well, if he would have filed the way that he was planning on filing, he would have been $30,000 shorter than what we would have put together for him as part of a social security strategy. Wow. That put real money back in his pocket. Yeah, and our last uh, of the horsemen here that we need to address and we need to do it quickly is long-term care. Yeah, long-term care, 70% of us over the age of 65 are going to need long-term care at some point in the future. Traditional long-term care insurance just isn't the answer anymore. Premiums have sometimes went up as high as 90%, making people either go back and pick up some part-time work just to pay for the premium, or they have to drop the coverage altogether. There's a lot of different types of coverages out there today that don't have to be traditional long-term care insurance 
insurance. And this is one of those things that can rip retirement right out of a well-structured retiree's plan. And this is why it has to be incorporated into a comprehensive strategy, because in many circumstances, it's the only thing that can take retirement away. So why wouldn't we put together some type of plan for it? Well, that makes a lot of sense. So if you are not really thinking about these four horsemen of retirement, boy, I sure hope you get on the ball. And you may be one of those people who has taken time and, and spent years investing and working with one advisor. Are they talking to you about these things? Here's an opportunity to sit down with somebody who is thinking about your future in a different way. I hope you're one of the next 10 people who get on the phone and call and request a complimentary review of exactly what's going on in your retirement plan. Have you thought about long-term care? Are there fees and taxes that you're paying that maybe you don't have to? What's going to happen with your long-term retirement and how much risk are you taking in your portfolio? All important things to think about and things that will be covered as you sit down with Casey or a member of the Howard Bailey team for a complimentary review of just how your retirement is structured. So be one of the next 10 people to grab the phone and make that call and put yourself on the path toward a purpose-based retirement. All right, we come back. We're answering questions from viewers. Hope you're still with us. You need a plan to create the retirement you deserve. The first step is to tune in to the Purpose Based Retirement Radio Hour with Casey Weed and Marshall Johnson. Saturdays at 11 a.m. and Sundays at 1 p.m. on WoWo 107.5 FM or Sunday mornings at 11 on 95.3 MNC. The highest educational achievement for a financial planner is the Certified Financial Planner Certification. At Howard Bailey, all of our frontline advisors are CFP practitioners. Certified financial planners have been thoroughly vetted with the right education and experience to coach you through the complexities of your retirement. Getting to retirement, that's really the easy part. Find someone with what it takes to get you through this next stage of your life. Would your financial and retirement affairs benefit from a higher level of insight and care? Call us now to find out. Info at HowardBailey.com is the email address. If you'd like to have your question featured here on the program, that's what Tom up in Shipshawana did. Tom, go ahead. Should I plan for more retirement income than I think I need or just build it around the basics? Well, I've worked with people that thought they needed $10,000 a month in income, and they ended up only needing $5,000 a month in income. And I've seen it the opposite way as well. And typically, those are people that just decided they were going to start doing their financial planning and retirement planning about a month or two months before they decided to actually step into retirement. And it's very difficult to predict what that retirement budget is going to be because you've never been retired before. You've never had that amount of free time on your hands. And I can promise you, in most circumstances, people need more income in retirement than they did prior to, prior to retirement when it comes to the amount of their actually the, their expenses or their discretionary income and what they're going to use those dollars for they typically end up spending more in retirement because they have more time with their friends they've got more time for family they've got more time for travel more time for golf more time for fishing and this is why I do typically if we haven't put it together a budget and really spend a lot of time on it and practicing then we might want to go ahead and build and a 10, 20% buffer in there because heck, if we end up creating more income than we need, we can always reinvest that income and we can make more adjustments with the playchecks than the paychecks. That's why I say to separate those things because we can create a guaranteed income stream for the paychecks that you can never outlive, the money we cannot live without. And then those playchecks that we might use to go on vacations or travel, the fun money that we might be able to live without, that might have more flexibility to it Maybe it's on 100% guaranteed. It's our at-risk income strategy. And if we don't need it, we can just restructure the income strategy. A guaranteed income strategy typically isn't quite as flexible. So that's why we want to separate those things and practice retirement. Thanks for your question. Yeah, heck, if you can't play golf, go fishing, or have fun, what's the point of retiring? Might right? as well keep well, on well working. Keep on working, yeah. <laughs> Let's get up to Butler and Pam, your question. Go ahead. We paid off our home with our emergency fund. So can we take a home equity line of credit as a replacement? Pam, you can take a home equity line of credit as an emergency fund replacement. I just want you to exercise a lot of caution, especially if you're thinking about stepping into retirement. I think in retirement, a HELOC is not the way to go for an emergency fund because that's not guaranteed in multiple ways. During 2008, a lot of home equity line of credits were pulled. So if you had one, now all of a sudden you couldn't draw on it anymore. They were just up and canceled. So those lines of credit can go away and the interest rates can go up quite dramatically as 
as well. They're not guaranteed for the entire term of the loan. Typically, they're tied to something like LIBOR. So you're going to have a floating interest rate on that loan that you're getting via that line of credit. And let's say you lock it in today, it's 4%, but in 20 years, you look at that line of credit and now it's 10 or 20 percent and now you want to pull something out of that fund. Now you've got an emergency, which means you probably don't have the cash that you can even service an interest rate that's, that is that high. I would say if you're going to step into retirement and you're planning on relying on your line of credit, it's time to sit down and first put a plan together because what we find quite often is we have plenty of cash and investments around that can act as our emergency fund. We just need to figure out a plan that tells us what we need for a retirement income, what we need for inflation, what we need for long-term care and basic health care needs, and then whatever's left over, maybe we want to take a portion of that and we want to carve it out and set it aside in cash so it can be there at a moment's notice in case we have an emergency and you say, well, what kind of emergency am I going to have? That might be an emergency that involves not just yourself, maybe it's your children, maybe it's your grandchildren that need to borrow some cash because they're in a tight spot. Maybe we need to put a new roof on the house, maybe that vacation that you were planning planning on taking in a couple of years, well, your friends just popped in and said, hey, we're going next month and you want to go on it. Any number of things can happen. And so let's spend a little bit more time working and at the very least put together a rock solid plan. And that might tell you, you don't even need to continue working. You just need to plan a little differently. Yeah, what a nice problem to have, Pam. Your house is paid off. That's a good move. Hey, let's get to John and Van Wert. I was just wondering why it is that my financial advisor never discusses taxes. It seems like that would be just as important as my returns. Well, John, most financial advisors and I mean most people, right? Most salespeople talk about things that they get paid for. So if I sell cars, I'm going to talk to you about selling cars, not the price of gasoline. If you start thinking about what a financial advisor is trained to do, they're trained to sell products typically at least at the start of their career until they become financial planners and become in and enter more of a fee-based approach. If you think about them doing tax planning and what that might cost them, one, it's going to cost them a significant amount of time, most of our advisors are spending hours just on the tax planning side of things when we're implementing a retirement plan on the front end. But think about doing things like a Roth conversion, for instance. If you've got $100,000 that you want to convert to a Roth IRA, it might take 25% away in taxes in order to do that Roth conversion. So now they're only able to manage $75,000 where they were able to manage $100,000. So by doing some tax planning, not only are, you, are they doing things that they're probably not getting paid to do, but you're also taking money out of their pocket. If they were charging 1% on that $100,000, it was $1,000. Now they're only going to get $750 moving forward. And some of these large brokerage firms, I hired an advisor from the largest brokerage firm in the country, and he said their corporation would not legally let them discuss taxes with their clients. And that 1090, that 1040 is the heartbeat of your financial life. You need to understand your taxes because it's not how much money you make. The returns are great. It's more about how much money you ultimately keep. So sit down, work with a certified financial planner that doesn't work for anybody but you and partners up with CPAs in order to incorporate that tax plan with your retirement plan. And John, the first step toward that is to pick up the phone and be one of the next 10 people to call right now and request a meeting with Casey or a member of the Howard Bailey team for a complimentary review of just what's going on in your retirement plan. You'll look at taxes, you'll look at retirement income, you'll look at fees and expenses you might be paying, lots of different things that color the nature of the retirement that could be ahead for you. So I hope you're one of the next 10 people who call and request that complimentary review. It's an important step toward getting your financial future on a path that we call the purpose-based retirement. All right, our question of the day has to do with the amount of money that is available if you have a five-year certificate of deposit. What is that CD rate? How much are you going to be getting back in interest? Casey has the answer. We come back. You need a plan to create the retirement you deserve. The first step is to tune in to the Purpose Based Retirement Radio Hour with Casey Weed and Marshall Johnson. Saturdays at 11 a.m. and Sundays at 1 p.m. on WoWo 107.5 FM or Sunday mornings at 11 on 95.3 MNC. The highest educational achievement for a financial planner is the Certified Financial Planner Certification. At Howard Bailey, all of our frontline advisors are CFP practitioners. Certified financial planners have been thoroughly vetted with the right education and experience to coach 
coach you through the complexities of your retirement. Getting to retirement, that's really the easy part. Find someone with what it takes to get you through this next stage of your life. Would your financial and retirement affairs benefit from a higher level of insight and care? Call us now to find out. Heading into the break, we asked her a question of the day. It had to do with a five-year certificate of disappointment, as Casey likes to call it. <laughs> so we've been watching the show, Lee. Yeah, exactly. So what is the current five-year certificate of deposit rate? The current five-year CD is paying 1.06% per year, and that doesn't quite keep us up with inflation, right? And the, ad, the highest CD rates in the country for five years are paying about 2.5%. A five-year treasury is also paying about 2.5%. A five-year fixed annuity is paying about 35 to 3.7% per year. And that means that there's a lot of advisors out there today, a lot of brokers that are reaching for yield and taking on greater and greater risk with your portfolio that you may be completely unaware of. This is why right now we're going to discuss with you someone that we recently worked with to audit their portfolio and share with them the risk that was lurking just beneath the surface. And it start, started by doing a third party snapshot of their overall portfolio. This is one of the things that we'll do one on one with you when you came in for your first visit with our team. And one of the things I want to point out here is we have about 50% in fixed income or bond. And that was only putting that and they were just stepping into retirement. So they were only a couple of years out from retirement had about 10% in cash. So that had that 60 40 portfolio mix which would be called the traditional balanced portfolio and at their age that's roughly where they should be however what we found was that they were reaching for yield which i'm going to share with you exactly what that means in just a minute so examining this 50 percent that's in bonds as we take another step forward we can see that it had an average maturity of 12 years and that means if we bought a bond today we're not going to get our original investment back for 12 years that's sometimes referred to as an intermediate bond that's really in the long end of intermediate you might also see that average credit quality being double B and being a double B bond you said well that's average and that's above average in school so a B must not be too bad and it's a double B it might be even better than that we're gonna find out in just a second a double B bond is actually referred to as a junk bond kindly as a high yield bond. If we take a look at those different rating agencies that are out there today, whether it's S&P and Fitch or Moody's, we find that a double B rated bond is a junk bond, which also means it's speculative in nature. That means it's higher risk. If we look at their biggest holding, in their overall portfolio. Their largest holding was in this Franklin high yield tax free income bond. A high yield bond fund is a junk bond fund. That is just an interchangeable definition of that specific type of bond. And over the last 10 years, we can see that this bond fund itself has depreciated by 3% over that period of time. If we want to know how, how often our bonds are going to default, we can take a look at this chart that was put together by Barclays and Alliance Bernstein, two of the largest research agencies in the world. 11% of double B rated bonds are going to default over a five-year period. 25% of B-rated bonds are going to default over a five-year period. That means if we started with $100,000, on average, we'll end up with $89,000 after five years with a double B-rated bond. And that doesn't even factor in what could be happening with interest rates along the way. If interest rates rise, bond prices fall. We want to distress test about a million dollars of their bond portfolio and see what would happen if we had a rising interest rate environment. Now, being that we owned a bond fund, they were going to have to participate in the losses and the asset value of that fund itself. If we had a million dollar bond coming due in 2030, that's 12 years in maturity, paying about 3% in interest, if we just had a 1% rise in interest rates, this bond portfolio would lose 9.1% or about $100,000 in value with just a one percentage point change 
in interest rates, and we know that's very possible. It could potentially even happen year after year for a number of years. And they were paying for this advice. They didn't think they were paying a whole lot for this advice. They thought they were paying a half a percent to 1% a year, and they were paying pretty darn close to that. After we audited their fees, we could see they were paying 0 0.6, 0 0.85, 0 0.9% roughly on this $1.5 million portfolio that didn't include their mutual fund expenses. The cost of their mutual funds was upwards of $10,000 a year, 0.82% per year, meaning that brought their overall cost to about 1.5% annually on $1.5 million, that's over $22,000 per year, and we could cut that down in a fraction. You might ask yourself, due to the interest rate risk that this couple had with, an in, with a mutual fund portfolio that invested in bonds and the extra expenses they had inside of those mutual funds, why would an advisor use a mutual fund at all? And one of the reasons is due to something that is buried deep within the financial industry, most specifically the brokerage industry, something called revenue sharing. And I'm gonna share with you a specific revenue sharing disclosure that you can read for yourself out there today. If you work with a large broker or a large bank, just Google revenue sharing and the bank or the custodian or the firm that you're working with, and you can probably read their disclosure on a PDF if you can decipher it. This is from the largest brokerage house in the country. Product partners for the year ended December 31st, 2017 received revenue sharing payments. We blocked out the name of the company. That company received revenue sharing payments of approximately $181 million from mutual fund and 529 product partners, 5.6 million from annuity product partners for that same period. Net income was $871 million. That meant that over 20% of their net revenues came from the mutual fund companies that they worked with. While you may have been better off buying an individual bond of a similar maturity to to avoid the interest rate risk, you ended up with a mutual fund that cost you more and put you at greater risk. So ask yourself these three questions. Number one, do you know what's inside of your portfolio? What is the makeup of your portfolio? Are you taking on greater risk than you understand, whether that be market risk or interest rate risk or default risk with the individual bonds that you own? Is your advisor reaching for a yield? And ultimately, what are you paying for that? What is the real cost of investing to you and your family? Let's see if we can't reduce that risk and put more money back in your pocket where it belongs. So, you know, when you were talking about revenue sharing, I kept hearing pay to play. That's kind of the same thing. That's a it? very, another name for revenue sharing is pay to play in order to be on the roster, to be something that that banker or that financial advisor, that broker is going to be able to sell you. They had to pay to play. This is why you're not going to find a Vanguard fund in place of American funds or FF, MFS or Franklin because Vanguard, John Bogle's not willing to give up his whole company philosophy of low cost investing in order to be on that roster. Well, I hope that's got you wondering about exactly what is in your portfolio and that you'll be one of the next 10 people to take a chance to find out. And that involves calling Howard Bailey Financial and asking for a complimentary review of your entire retirement plan. It's a chance to learn exactly what's going on. Is there pay to play in your portfolio? Are there some junk bonds lurking there that you didn't know about? It's an opportunity to really learn about your money so you can make the best decisions for yourself and your family going forward. So I hope you're one of the next 10 people to jump on the phone and request a complimentary meeting with either Casey or a member of the Howard Bailey team and learn more about exactly what might be lurking in your portfolio. You can always learn more by going to howardbailey.com. You can get a copy of Casey's books at thepurposebasedretirement.com. And, of course, we'll be back next week. We hope we'll see you then.